think of ancient Rome, we tend to think of Caesar, gladiators, a vast empire that stretches over enormous amounts of land. But Rome has had a long history and has done things at times that Roman people themselves and people in modern times think, what the hell were y'all doing? One of these times would be an end of an era, caused by debauchery, leading to a year of war that would stretch across continents. A time when all of Rome was up for grabs for any who had the power to lay claim. This is the year of the four emperors. It all begins with the last emperor of the Julio-Claudian dynasty, Emperor Nero. For those who don't know, Emperor Nero was not a good guy. Torture, murder, a man distraught and ill in both his head and his soul. And because of his behavior and deeds, many hated him. Many wished him ill. Many wished him dead. During Nero's reign, Riots and revolts would pop up from time to time, but one revolt would lead the Roman Empire into a power struggle and civil war. This would change Rome's course in history. In 68 AD, Gaius Julius Vindex decided to stand and try to remove Nero as emperor. Vindex was a Roman governor of the Gallia Ludicinius territory, which was a territory in modern-day France. He held a decent amount of power, but Vindex knew it was not enough to fight against the emperor, so he sought out allies. The man Vindex got and wanted was a man named Galba, who at the time was the governor of Hispania. Galba was a politician man. He knew the game. He knew who would be good friends, and who would be the worst foes. So once Galba joined Vindex, many small nobles and other supporters joined, for they had high respect of Galba. Together, Galba and Vindex would raise an army of multiple legions and begin to march eastward towards Rome. Vindex and his army would be met in the battle against Lucius Virginius Rufus and an army of legions loyal to Nero. Rufus would quickly defeat Vindex's army and help bring Vindex's own life to an end. Galba, being a supporter of Vindex, would be declared a traitor and an enemy of Rome. But Galba would live and not meet the end of Rufus's sword. Vindex and Galba's action would create a power vacuum and start the chaos. In June 68 AD, the Praetorian Guard, which was a small Roman army in itself, slash bodyguards, made up of elite warriors whose tasks were to guard the emperor. Well, Nero, being an ass, as he was, kind of treated them like shit and forgot to pay them. And with Galba and Vindex's major revolt, they started thinking to themselves, why are we protecting this guy? Also, I want to point out, Treating people who are supposed to protect your life like crap and not paying them? Well, I think that's just dumb in any time in history. So, the Praetorian Guard, led by Nifididius Sabinus, devised their own plot to rid of the tyranny which was Nero. Hearing of this portrayal about to happen before it happened, and knowing he had no true allies, the Senate would turn on Nero and declare him an enemy of the state. This would cause Nero to panic and flee for his life and bring him to the point of suicide, which he couldn't do himself, so he had his secretary kill him. Now the throne was empty. With a fell swoop, Nero went from emperor to traitor, and Galba, who was still alive, went from traitor to emperor. How quickly the tides turned. It was declared that Galba was now the rightful emperor of Rome, that his uprising against Nero was justified. So Rome declared Galba as emperor, and Galba, who is still the governor of Hispania, began to make his way to Rome to sit on the vacant throne. Now, travel in history has always been a long and tedious thing, and many, many things can happen in that span of time. 
Surprise, surprise, some things did. People of the Roman Empire began to dislike and even hate Rufus and his legionnaires, the men who defeated Vindex and Galba. Even though they were just doing their jobs, the soldiers were kind of like, what the fuck? The rest of the Roman Empire started to hate them. A few months ago, Galba was a public traitor who was marching towards Rome to take it. Now, no one cared. And the people started to treat anyone who was against Galba with disgust, especially the soldiers that defeated Galba and killed Vindex. And while all this was brewing and happening, on Galba's long march from his territory to Rome, Galba would pick up the habit of fucking over town after town, city after city, all along his route, making people pay high taxes, destroying towns, and vetoing Nero, some decrees Nero made as emperor, even though he was crazy, some actual people liked them and didn't want those laws to change. So by the time Galba finally made it to Rome, he was already hated, and many worried that Galba would become a dictator. As Galba was in Rome, he'd make, well, the same mistakes as Nero, the same mistakes that allowed him to become emperor in the first place. He too would treat the Praetorian Guard like crap, and also not pay them. My man, did you learn nothing? Then the year 69 AD would come, and civil war would basically begin. On January 1st, 69 AD, the legionnaires in Germanian territory and the legions that fought against Vindex would go, Nah, Galba isn't our emperor. The next day, on January 2nd, declared Aulius Ventelius as their emperor, who, at the time, was the governor of the Germanian territory. Just a little tidbit of knowledge, being a legionnaire in Germanian territory during this time period would almost guarantee combat and fighting, which meant all of Vitellius' soldiers were veterans and experienced. So when Galba heard the news on who was pissed at him and who the northern legionnaires want as their emperor, and also coming to the realization that the bodyguards he was supposed to pay and treated, and treated them like crap, well, he knew he was screwed. So in a last-ditch effort, which would be his actual final nail in the coffin, Galba would adopt a young senator by the name of Lucius Copernius Pisolicicinius as his successor as emperor. For Galba himself had no children and needed an heir for the throne. This basically put everyone in an uproar. Everyone in Rome and part of the Senate all thought that Marcus Salvius Altho was and should have been the successor. And apparently Altho himself thought this as well. Seeing an opportunity, Altho would begin to make moves and capitalize on the situation. He bribed the Praetorian guard, basically saying, Hey, Nero and Galba didn't pay you. I'll pay you. Be on my side. Fuck Galba and Lucius, am I right? Galba will get word of this bribery and go to confront the guards, where he and his chosen successor, Lucius, would be killed by those guards. Otho would keep his word and pay the guards. As soon as their bodies hit the floor, Otho was recognized by the Senate as Emperor of Rome. Still one small problem, though. Vitellius in Germania, with his army, who were now on their way south to take the throne. Otho, who was now emperor with one fell swoop, quickly gathered his own army and went north to meet Vestelius in battle. A wide-open civil war has started. Otho knew before the fighting even started that he would most likely lose the war. A quickly assembled army versus army of seasoned veterans? Not great odds. So Otho tried to find a peaceful solution, sending envoys and even offering to marry Vestelius' daughter. This was to no avail. Vitellius was already so far south, and he already knew that he had all the advantages. The fighting would start, and Otho's army was defeated completely in the Battle of Bedricium. Otho, now knowing he had no army, no support, no options, decided to kill himself. Otho was emperor for about three months. Basically, while Otho's body was still warm, the Senate would declare Vitellius as, em as emperor. Man, those politicians, 
they have a quite interesting pattern. Definitely bend with the breeze, so to speak. And unfortunately for Rome and Vitellius, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Vitellius would be over the moon about becoming emperor, feeling as though he himself was immortal. As soon as he got to Rome, he would have feasts galore, massive parties, and parades in his honor. He would celebrate and party so much that very quickly he would make the imperial treasure go into bankruptcy. Though transportation was slow in ancient times, word still had the ability to travel fast. So soon as everyone was hearing that the imperial treasury was bankrupt, many people would come to Vesalius to collect the money he owed, and a bank rush would begin, so to speak. Vitellius, feeling powerful and also having no money to pay them, he did that he did the next best thing he could think of. Kill them and make examples of the people who came to collect debts that he owed. Now, while all this was happening, on the other side of the Roman Empire in Africa and the Middle East, the Romans in this part of the world and territories were hearing about the turntable of emperors. Along with hearing how Vitellius was bankrupting Rome and killing the people who came to collect debts. So they decided, much like Vitellius' situation, to choose their own emperor and the African-controlled part of the Roman Empire. They chose Vespasian. Vespasian, for the most part, was chosen by legionnaires under his command. Vespasian accepted the nomination. Vespasian would, would choose a powerful ally, a governor, governor of Syria, who happened to be very, very good at war, Gaius Licaninius Musinianus. Vespasian would make Gaius his general and told him to take the army and march it to Rome. Vespasian himself, on the other hand, would travel to Alexandria and on July 1st publicly declare himself as emperor of Rome to the world. While Gaius was marching the army closer and closer, a Marcus Antonius Primius, who had legions of his own from the territories of Ratia and Mosia, decided that he was also done with Vitellius and wanted to help Vespasian to be emperor too. Now, Vitellius has two separate armies marching towards him at this point. He has no money in the bank, the Senate's not behind him, and everyone's angry. Not a great situation to be in. The nice thing also is Marcus Atenius Primus was much closer to Italy and reached there way before Vespasian's army. Marcus's army versus Ventinius' army, another civil war in the same year. Marcus would win basically by a landslide because, well, being legionnaires in those territories also meant you were a seasoned combat veteran. Funny enough, Marcus even defeated Vitellius in the same spot where Vitellius defeated Otho, making it the second battle of Bedcarnium in the same year. Vitellius, now having no army, no hope, in a panic, tried to make allies with anyone and everyone, making a huge grand promise and tried to sue for peace with Vespasian. It did not work. No one wanted to come to a drowning man. Vespasian's army was now at Rome's gate. Vitellius would now try to flee the city and save his own life. While Vespasian's army was physically at the city, Vitellius would try to see the palace one last time before he fled. It would be a huge mistake. Vespasian's men would find Vitellius and kill him. Now, if I was an invading force looking for an emperor, the first place I would probably go would be the palace. So not the smartest decision by Vitellius to go back there. Then, the next day, on December 21st, 69 AD, the Senate would acknowledge and claim Vespasian as Emperor of Rome. As for Vespasian, he would eventually make his way from Africa to Rome and rule. Rule for the rest of his life as Emperor of Rome, and die from old age in 79 AD. Vespasian's rise to power and rule would begin an entire new dynasty, 
the Palladian dynasty. And something I kind of liked about Vespasian's last words before he died, he spoke, Dear me, I must be turning into a god. Not the worst last words I've ever heard of. Not the best, but also not the worst. And that was the year of four emperors. A time where if you had the soldiers, Rome's throne was yours for the taking. And the, and the Senate would gladly support you while you do. I hope you all enjoyed this episode. To me, it was very funny thinking about how a throne to one of the most powerful empires in history was basically a revolving door. And as always, thank you all for listening. Thank you.